Do your bases suck? No, probably not. But why not stick around, check out this video and see if there's a few tips and tricks that you might be able to pick up the next time that you want to make some awesome bases. Hi, my name's Ben, this is the mini painting page and today I wanted to go over a base that I'm looking at making suitable for both sci-fi as well as fantasy. This base is a muddy battlefield base with rocky outcroppings that I want to make sure is quick, simple and awesome. Now let's not waste any more time and get down to it. Starting off I have a few of the essentials I will need. Naturally you will need some form of base, here I'm using a old Games Workshop base that I have lying around, but you could also use a slim sheet of board etc, something like that, just make sure that it's water resistant. I also have some plant matter to add some life to the base, cork sheets or cork bark for the rocks, texture paste to build up the mud and then one of my favourite items for dirt, debris and a few other tricks, which is the dust from sanding cork. And finally some super glue to bring it all together, lock it down so that we don't lose any of our work. With that covered, let's get building. Now kicking it off, I start by taking some cork bark and pulling off sections which are roughly the size that I'm looking for. This could be one larger rock which is used for the model to stand on. Alternatively, it could be some smaller rocks off to the side to add to the scene of the model. I would recommend using cork bark for this over cork sheets as this will give more of a natural texture once painted. Once I'm happy with the size of the cork and the, where it will be roughly on the base, I use some sandpaper to make sure that the part that will butt up against the base is flush. Keep this in mind because naturally by sanding the cork down, there will be a reduction in height, so bear that in mind when picking out your cork for your base. Then we want to save the remains into our tin. Now that I have the rock picked out and it's nice and flush, I can move over to the mud of the battlefield. This is where I'm using the structure gel, which I think tends to be used on canvas paintings. But I find it works very similar to products like Sterling Mud, but comes out in a much bigger bottle, which makes it more cost effective. Using this structure gel and a cheap gunk brush, I slap the gel all over the base to get a decent first layer coverage. No need to be particularly careful here, this gel does take a little while to dry, which means that you can go in and mop up any errors as well as adjust any peaks and troughs in the gel before it dries. Then what we want to do is take our rock from earlier, we can decide on the placement on the base, add some super glue to the bottom of the rock that we sanded earlier and smush this into the gel in the chosen location. You will see by doing this the rock becomes fixed into place relatively well and is less likely to move and the gel itself is pushed out from under the bottom of the rock and beads up nicely around it. We can then use our brush and blend this beaded gel into the rock and the rest of the base. This is one of the main reasons why I suggest using a junky gunky brush for this particular job because the super glue that we apply to the rock may get compressed out with the structure gel underneath and if we go in with a brush and start blending that in we may get some super glue as well as structure gel naturally into our brush. We don't want to risk any nice decent brushes with that so use an old junk brush for this particular purpose. That's what I'm doing here so I'm not particularly worried and I can just go round and blend the gel and the rock together to remove that appearance of just a rock being plonked on a base. Now that I've confirmed the placement of the rocks on the base, I can look at the remaining space, come back and make any final changes. This may be to the gel if I want to restructure it, or it may be adding some small extra rocks as I am here. For these, I would do the same as the larger rocks, adding a little bit of glue underneath, squishing it into the texture gel, blending it in and making sure that I'm happy with the overall structure of both the rocks and the remaining paste, reforming as needed. Once I have this area done, I would actually use this as an opportunity, if my model isn't as of yet painted, to grab the model and imprint footprints onto the base itself. This will help with making sure the model goes into the right place at the end of the painted base stage as well as being able to give you the opportunity to put additional footprints in to add life and world building to the base. This is one of the reasons why I like to make sure that when I'm building a model, I build a base in conjunction, as opposed to separately and as an afterthought. Now as a final touch, I want to add some variation in texture to the base, and I'm going to take some of the trusty cork bark dust that I mentioned earlier, and sprinkle this onto the gel to add some roughness and additional texture. Here I'm aiming for bits of rubble from the rocks that have mixed in with the mud and by using a varying amount of sandpaper amounts you'll get different particle sizes from the cork. This is what I'm using here to get a nice crunchy texture around the rock placement. Now there are a couple things to bear in mind at this stage. One, the texture gel itself may shrink slightly as it dries and this may vary depending on what product you're using. So if you've made any high peaks, excessive peaks and things like that, you may want to double check it once it's dry and go in and reform and touch these up if needed. The second thing is the cork dust that we've applied at this precise moment 
hasn't fully cured and dried in it is only fixed in with the texture gel so we don't want to be too rough and tumble with it until it has all been locked in and secured however once it is dry it should start to look something like this now that the base is all dry we can move over to the painting of this built base and try and make it look all sexy so i started off by base coating it with a chaos black spray followed up with a skull white spray from above do you remember how I mentioned we'd need to be cautious of the cork dust? Well, now that the base has been sprayed in a couple of coats and is completely dry, all the bits we've added should hopefully be locked down and less of a worry so we don't have to be as cautious and we can be a little bit more rough and tumble if we need to be. Now, starting with the painting, I'm going to be taking a greenish brown for the first layer and applying this to the mud and debris. The reason that I'm using this greenish brown is to quickly and easily add some color variants later on down the line. So make sure to stick around so you can see what's happening there. With this, we do want to make sure that we have a even coat or as close to an even coat as possible. And depending on the particular color you are using, if it is not this one, there may be the requirement to do a few coats. So continue with that until it is completely coated. And once the mud and the debris is painted, we can move over to the rocks. Now here I'm going to be using a wide array of colours in the form of inks and the reason for this is that inks tend to be highly saturated in pigment, flow easily and also mix quite well and taking these colours I add this to the rock in random placements. This gives the rock a mixed colour base to work from which will add hopefully a little bit of nuance and bring up the look of the base without a lot of work. By the end of this process my rock does look a little bit like a unicorn throw up on it but at the end of the day that is what we're going for. Now that we've got all of these colours down on the base, we can move over to leveraging another quick easy technique which is dry brushing. Dry brushing does tend to get bullied a little bit in the hobby for some reason. I believe it's mainly because of the texture that it can leave behind on certain surfaces when being used and depending how you use it. However, in this instance we're not trying to win a golden demon, we're trying to make an awesome gaming base. So we can actually leverage and benefit from the texture that can get left behind by dry brushing on certain surfaces. So if you want to take a little bit extra care here, you can do, but I'm just going to do a nice, quick, dirty dry brush. So let's jump into that. Now, as mentioned, we're going to start by dry brushing. And here I'm using a greenish cream color all over the base, the rocks, the mud, the debris and everything just to give an underlying tone. Then I'm progressing up to an ivory color, which I'm doing the same thing, followed by an off white, which I use on the highest edges of the base. So the top of the rocks and the sides and edges of the base. Doing this all over the base brings the tones together and harmonizes it to a degree while also leaving the past steps visible in the recesses. So this is the brown colors that we've used for the mud blended nicely up to the lighter white coats without a lot of work. Next, following the principles for a quick, easy and good looking paint job, I'm going to use washes. These ones being from Games Workshop and I'm going to be using a brown wash on the muddy areas. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that I used not a wood brown and a off brown color in the base coating step because now that we're using a more woody brown in the wash it will add a nice amount of difference in color without a lot of work. So with this wash and I apply it all over the mud sections deciding how much pooling I want across the base to represent filth that's been washed into these muddy pits and at this point I want to make sure that I cover both the mud and the debris areas. Once the mud and debris area is dry, I can move over to the rocks and again the debris. In a similar step, I'm covering the rocks and debris in a separate colour, this case a black wash, which will shade and give nice definition to the rock. I also make sure I'm covering the debris again, and this means that it is getting both a brown wash as well as a black wash. Now, we are going to want to let this dry fully before continuing. You can go in and use something like a hairdryer to speed this up but just make sure that you're doing it either from a fair distance or at a low pressure so that you don't blow the wash all out of the places that you've aimed for it to get to. Now, once the base is dry once again, I do another wash over each section and let it dry once more. Coming back in with a brown wash on the muddy areas, but this time I want to be more targeted with the wash by avoiding the debris that we covered the first time round. And again, after drying, I then want to come in with a black wash and cover the rocky areas and the debris. This further brings down the colours, gives it a slightly more muted effect and helps with the blending between the colours of the rock and the mud. As inevitably, I'm going to get some overlap between the wash that's going on the rock and the wash that's going on the mud. So those will help to give a nice blend across the two without it being too jarring. Now, some washes, including the ones I'm using here and potentially ones by other brands, can leave behind a glossy finish on your base. And while this may be an effect we want in some circumstances, such as on wet, sticky, gooey mud, 
we want to be able to choose where these effects take place. So to help this, what I'm going to do is apply a couple coats of a very strong matte varnish, and I'll apply this to the whole base, mud, debris, and rocks, which will knock back the shine and also protect the work that we've done so far. Now that's the base painted to an acceptable tabletop style. And if we wanted, we could put a model on it and send it out to get shot by Tyranids whenever we want. However, we could also want to add a little bit extra to these bases. This could be blood effect, water effect, or in my case, it's going to be plant life and extra color to the base. So here I'm opting to use some undergrowth. And I did deliberately choose a brighter green color, which will hopefully contrast with the more muted base. And bear in mind the location of where you want your model to be, as well as where you want the plants and additional materials to be placed. You don't want it getting in the mod middle and in the way of your model, essentially. So here, given the mud feel, I feel that a plant would be a good thing because there would be moisture. And I feel that a plant growing from the cracks of the rocks where seeds may get caught would look believable and not interfere with any model that I'm looking to place on this base. For any base you're doing, you may want to use something like static grass or tufts and match the color to the environment you imagine your model to be in, whether it's a natural or a sci-fi environment. So with my decision made on the type of plants that I'm going to be using and the location and theory behind it, I'm going to take a little bit of super glue and apply that to the foliage and then apply the foliage to a crevice in the rock. Once this is stuck down, I'm going to take a little bit more super glue on the underside of the vines, use this to stick it to the rock to make it look like the plant is trying to climb the rock to get additional sunlight. And it will also have the added benefit of sticking it down and making it less likely to come off when transporting it from game to game. I tend to find it easier here to use tweezers to get into all of the small nooks and crannies. I unfortunately don't have good articulation in my fingers. I'm a bit terrible in that sense. However, if you feel capable of just doing it with your nails, feel free, fill your boots. So once that's done and everything's stuck down, I'm happy with my placement. I can look at cleaning up the base room ready for a game. Here you can use whatever color you want. If you don't want the internet hating you, apparently you need to use black or potentially goblin green. However, if you want to do a hazard strike base, that's entirely you, you do you, and I look forward to seeing it. But that's the base ready for a game, so we can stick it in a box and we're good to go. So it's as easy as that. Once it's painted, it's all sorted. And this is a technique that you can use and vary in small minute ways to get decent variation across either armies or individual units within an army. So such as you could apply particular effects. As I mentioned earlier, you've got blood effects or you've got water effects. You could also change it and make it look like a different style of rock, potentially swapping in slate, or just changing the colors of washes that you're using on the bases themselves. Here, I've got a couple of examples of alternate color schemes. I essentially did the exact same thing that I did here. The only thing that I swapped out is one was dry brushed in a gray color as opposed to a cream, and then the same steps were followed. And the other one was following the exact same steps, except swapping out the washes just to show you how easy we can get variation with this exact same technique. So that's what they look like, and you can see how much variation you can get across all of these bases. Now, if that got your creative juices flowing, but you don't feel like you want to make a particular muddy or a rocky base, maybe you'd be interested in this video here where we go over how to make a very simple Mars or desert base. And if you enjoyed this, please remember to subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.